Hey, Melanie, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Great. Well, so I've, I've been in sales all of my life. Uh, love it. I think everybody sells themselves, you know, every single day. They just really don't realize it. But uh, I love being able to have the challenge of solving people's problems, helping them to, you know, get to their goals and just feel good about that. So I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. How'd you get into it? So actually, when I was uh, 19 and I graduated from high school, I decided I wanted to go into the tire and service business. Of course. And I knew, not, of course, right. Who wouldn't? <laughs> I have actually knew nothing about cars. I, I was very green, but it uh, seemed something very interesting and a challenge, which I was always up for. And they said, well, you have no experience. And I'm like, well, how am I going to get the experience if nobody will ever give it to me? So I made a deal with them. I said, hey, if I'm not doing good for you in two months from now, not only will I resign, but I will train somebody to take my place if that will help you out. So I got the opportunity and needless to say, short period of time after a couple of years, I had my own store. So I was a manager, three women out of 180 stores in California and, uh, you know, just pursued sales after that. Just loved it. You know, uh, worked many jobs. I was actually married to a soldier at the time for 22 years. So we moved around a lot. Uh, every job that I've had, you know, I've, I've given them three to four months notice. And as you know, with sales, as soon as you say, I'm done, you're gone. You know, these, they just don't know. But with my work ethic and me offering to train the next person to come in that took it off of them, uh, I've been able to keep every job up until literally the day before I, I left. So it's, it's been a journey. It's been great. And how'd you get into B2B business to business? So actually, uh, I started that really when I went to El Paso, Texas, and I worked for a company called ChemSearch and started working with them and selling grease, oils, degreasers, that type of stuff, and calling on, you know, of course, the, the key influencers and top guys. Uh, that's always fun. And just getting in there and, and doing my thing. I, I've loved it. Uh, been very successful at it started in the territory and they, they gave me five customers to, you know, carry over from the previous rep. <laughs> That's a lot, <laughs> but, uh, actually made P club for president's club. My very first year there, it went from 185,000 a year. You needed jumped to 252,000 four months before the year ended. And I ended up doing that and, uh, pulling it off my first year with them. So stayed there for 12 years. And then I decided to get in with Unifirst. So my kids were grown. I didn't need to have as much flexibility being able to go to all their events and, you know, take care of all the, the marching band stuff. So I decided to go into uh, sales management with Unifirst. And I've been there for the last four years, uh, manager in training for two years and three months and came to Clarksville, Tennessee a year and eight months ago. So this is my very first full year as a sales manager with them and ended up second in the company uh, for sales. And what was the impetus to get into leadership? You know, I really wanted to share my knowledge and what I knew because as I was, you know, finding out that the, of course the upcoming generation, it, it's a whole different type of generation. You know, they, they don't do things the way that we're used to doing them. And I wanted to take some of that old school mentality and share it with them to help make things a little bit easier for them where they can bridge that gap, understand, you know, what's going on and how to do things. So I really, my love for sales, you know, I just wanted to flourish and, and share it with everybody. But did you miss the financial side of being a rep? <laughs> you know, I, I will say that at times, yes, I'm just like, you know, I think when we're in sales positions at any time, we always kind of pull our hair out and think, what am I doing here? What's going on? You know, I could do more doing a sales rep and make more money than I could. But I think at that time, the love for wanting to share and help others and to bring them up just outweighed yeah. the financial purposes and at the point of my life I was at. And what are you seeing? When you're hiring reps, what do you look for? <clears throat> so uh, most of the things that I look for, number one is integrity. I mean, you, you've got to have integrity. You've got to be coachable, um, you know, willing and, and to do the job. You, you've got to be able to be flexible in the fact that their flexibility is, 
I need to come in late sometimes, leave early, you know, have a two hour lunch, but they need to be able to know that this is not a nine to five job. You know, it's, it's what you put in it is what you're going to get out of it. So in the beginning, it's going to take a heck of a lot more to get up to that point. So long as they're, they're flexible and willing to do that persistence drive, you know, the eagerness to learn and want to know what they're presenting. How do you tell that though? You know, you ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, you you ask them their experiences. Some may not necessarily have experience in sales, which that can be just as good. Uh, this way you can, um, you know, train them the way that you want them to do the process. There's no, you know, my way's better. Uh, I'll just do it that way. But you just ask questions about their sales experiences. How do you go about finding the company that you want to sell to? How do you go at that point from finding the key people to talk to? How did you go about setting that appointment and what did you say to them? You want to really dig in and find out how they do their research, you know, where they know to go to do research. Um, once they get that appointment set, what objections did they have? How did you overcome them? You just want to know the whole process. You want them walking you through that from beginning to end. So you you kind of learn and pick up a lot about that to see where where they've been and what they know at this point. And <clears throat> what red flags do you typically see? You know, if if their story changes, uh, you know, in the middle of it, uh, they're they're fidgeting. Uh, sometimes they can't keep eye contact with you and have a conversation. Um, and if people aren't really prepared and ready, I mean, you should pretty much know when you're going into interviews, some of the typical questions that they ask, but if you have to pause for a long period of time and really try to think of a success story that you've had, or when you've come across an opportunity and an obstacle that you had to overcome, how did you do that? If, if it can't be top of mind, then it, I don't think it's just somebody that you're really looking for. And what I'm seeing a lot, and it comes flying up is the world should work my way, which is the exact <laughs> opposite of sales, right? Right, right. <laughs> and when you hear that, and I, I had the experience this morning, I, there's like that 10 things that require no talent. Mm -hmm. And when I see salespeople argue with that, I'm like, you're in the wrong profession. If you can't get to a place on time, buy an alarm clock. <laughs> if you can't right. prepare, guess what's going to happen? It's going to fall apart. Well, I will tell you my saying is my kids used to, mom, what are you talking about? That doesn't make sense. Of course they understand it now, but I would, to be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late. And my sales reps now, that's all they hear from me. You know, and, and I say, if you're late to our meeting, you're going to be late out there. So you've got to respect, you know, not only our time and what we have planned together, but also respect other people's time because sometimes you only get one chance. And if you miss that opportunity, it could be huge. <clears throat> right. Because it all comes down to empathy. What does the client want? Right. If you're late, that breaks trust. You're telling me your time's more important than mine. Right. If you're not prepared, I, I don't know what we're talking about. It, exactly. Exactly. And like I said, you get that one shot to make that first impression, that's still rule. You know, first impression is what counts. And after that, you know, it's very hard to gain that trust back and it takes a long time and you're working much harder at it. So I, I really try to instill that into the reps and, and let them know. And it's repeated very often, believe me. <laughs> and what do you think makes a great sales leader? Somebody who is willing to work with the rep somebody who's willing to give them and supply them with the tools that they need to help them in any way to get down and do the actual work with them and show them. So kind of an example here, uh, recently we had a, a big school district that we needed to install dispensers with. And the rep that I had underneath me was promoted to sales manager. And so he moved on, but still needed this to be able to get to P club. So my husband, who's a mobile mechanic, he actually set a week aside and decided him and I, we went and installed 544 dispensers Is that after all? we removed that. That's <laughs> it. That's it. 
1500 boxes of soap and sanitizer, uh, you know, and you just do it. It was a week of nothing but going to school and putting up dispensers, taking them down. So yeah, we, we actually, uh, <laughs> we had a heck of a time though. It, it was fun. And, and I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's not just talking the talk, it's walking the walk <clears throat> and I'll go to the extremes or whatever I need to do, whether it's, you know, get my hands dirty uh, or, you know, whether it's go on a meeting or, or set an appointment or whatever it takes. It's just, you've got to be willing to be flexible yourself and make it happen. And how do you balance that with the, the, the administrative requirements, the, the meetings on your side with your managers? Right. So, I mean, obviously you, you really need to have your schedule set where you schedule your time. I mean, sometimes you even have to put in there, you know, schedule your lunch time for 30 minutes or so, because at times you just get going and things get moving. And, you know, sometimes you just need that little break to kind of set aside. So just scheduling and making sure you're very organized and keeping, you know, if you can keep them as consistent as possible, things change. I get it. You know, we, we move things around at times last minute, even, but just trying to keep things orderly and, and, you know, where everybody knows what should be going on at what time. And what's the hardest part of your job? Hmm. You know, I, I try to make everything fun um, and look at always the bright side of things. But I would say probably the hardest part of my job is in, in all reality, just trying to juggle everything, just making sure that everybody has what they need and, trying to make sure that I'm spending as much time with each person as they need, not what I feel that they need. So it's sometimes it, you know, um, clashes because two may need you at once, but we, we always end up figuring it out. And how about the different styles of people? Because everyone sells a little bit different and everyone thinks their style is the best. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> it's almost like uh, politics and religion because once you start touching it, it's, oh, he's a relationship guy or, oh, no, he's a top down person. <laughs> right, right. I got it. I mean, there there are. It's it's so different. And and that's probably, in, in all honesty, that's probably been my biggest area of opportunity and where I've grown so much in the last couple of years, just learning to you know, because before it's treat everybody equal opportunity, everybody needs to be treated the same. And it's not. I think that's probably the biggest lesson that I've learned in management, that you can't treat everybody the same. And you need to make that very open and um, share that with your team, because you don't want them thinking it's favoritism, that, you know, this person gets to do this. Well, if you have a P club rep, and you know, they're doing their thing and they may not be at a particular meeting or they have, you know, an A account that they need to go see. And, you know, well, why do they get to go? Or, you know, everybody needs to kind of know the dynamics of the team, what's going on with each person. And you're all going to get treated differently because you all have different needs. You're, you're all in a different place. Yes. You know, you can strive to be, you know, where your P club rep is, and that's what we want you to do. However, don't try and skip those steps because you'll never get there if you're not following the process and doing what you need to do. That's it because a lot of leaders do the opposite. They try and pull down the president's club rep and distribute the territory among the C players. And now everything's equal. Right. Oh, yeah, but it's not working anymore. Right. Right. Oh, I, I I totally agree. I mean, they should technically at the end of the day have the bigger piece of the pie than everybody else. And then when you work up and you build that, I mean, heck, who knows? You could maybe build a bigger piece of pie just in the territory you have by working it. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you keep them all motivated? Because everybody's got mood swings and roller coasters through the quarter. Right, right. I, you know, I have a very candid conversation with my reps and say, look, you know, we're, we're all going to have those days where we're not feeling so hot. You know, we get frustrated. Um, I want you guys to hold me accountable as much as I want to hold you accountable. It's call me out. I mean, no hard feelings. It's not going to be, you know, uh, I'm not going to be mad at you. Just if, if you see me doing something or even a look on my face that just, you know, doesn't look happy 
tell me, let me know. Just call me out in front of people. That's fine. I'm not going to do that with them if it's something that I need to kind of talk to them. But we've all come to an agreement to hold each other accountable, to cheer each other up, see how we can help if we notice someone's having a bad day. So I think if you openly talk about it and, you know, discuss it and all come to a consensus, it it really definitely helps out because, you know. And I'm sure you've worked for okay sales managers, have met not so great sales managers. What are the differences in in your viewpoint? So people person, you know, they, some are just driven by the numbers or the activities and you got to be results driven and people oriented. You've got to, you've got to get personal. I, I mean, I know people say, don't get personal with your sales reps. Don't, but you got to get to know them as a person to know who they are, what makes them tick, what, you know, makes them happy. What are their whys? As a matter of fact, you know, I've got a, a pretty new sales team um, with some reps on there. And that was one of the first things that we did is what is your why? So let's go around the room. We'll all talk about our why, what we're here for, because if you're not, if you're only accountable to yourself, it's easy to let yourself down and to fail yourself. You know, if you don't feel like getting out of bed this morning and you don't have anybody to answer to, or you don't have this goal to go after, it's easy to say, you know what? It's raining outside. Mm, It's a day. I'll make some phone calls throughout the day. No big deal. You know, so you've just got to be able to be a people person and get intimate if you want to use a word and find out about their kids, their grandkids, uh, find out what they like, what they don't like, where their favorite restaurant is. I mean, if you don't have that personal relationship with your sales rep, at the end of the day, it's just business. And then there's nothing there to keep them there. And have you found a certain correlation between certain whys and other whys where the the president's club people typically have this this type of why and the people who aren't successful you, you know different. yeah i i think when the from from my experience when sales reps have a why that includes their family then it's much bigger because you don't want to disappoint them you don't want to disappoint anyone if they have maybe a, a why of hey i want to get a brand new car it's a good why. I mean, you know, if you need the money and you need to make sure that you have that extra income coming in, that's great. But I think that you, if it's tied to family that you can get on board as well and get them talking about it, they're more likely to hold you accountable when you're at home. So if you come home and you have a bad day and you might be complaining about something or talking about, oh, you know, the, the negative stuff, they can flip that around and say, hey, you know, give you the silver lining of it or saying by doing this, you know, you're going to be able to get to your why we're going to be able to have this RV where we're going to be able to do more traveling in places that we want to go or, you know, we're going to be able to pay off the house sooner so we can have more freedom. So I think by getting them involved and them knowing your why as well, that that's super important. And what I've seen is like, if they're their why is not aligned with sales where they're like, well, I just like people. Right. Okay, right. That, that's great for service for sales. You'll get meetings and conversations, but if you're not, you know, laser beam focused on who's most likely to buy in what order. Right. You're, you're going to be drifting around like a leaf in the wind. Absolutely correct. It's got to be financially tied to mo- a monetary value that is bigger than what you can achieve. Because you know, you you've got to always, and I tell them when you hit that goal, it's not the end. You've got to have something even bigger to go. It's great to get to baby steps and milestones and you know, celebrate them, but you've got to have that just out of the ordinary goal that you know you need to reach because you're you're absolutely right. And and that would bring me back to another red flag in the interview when you're asking them what motivates you. What, why are you in sales? What, you know, tell me, tell me why you got in sales. And, and it's really got to be a love for, you know, what you can make in sales, the opportunity. And of course, behind that is you're going to get out of it, what you put into it. You know, you've got to really have that why to get, you know, to that point. So uh, that's, that's definitely a great point to bring up. That's it. Because when it's not there, they show up 
and they smile and nod. And they're like, well, it's my territory. It's this because it's always something. Right, right. And, you know, I will give an example. So for my reps right now, I use because you you hear that a lot. Oh, I got a terrible territory and there's so much windshield time and there's nothing out there. I said, all right. So there's this rep in San Antonio when I started with the company and he's been here for 23 years. He's made in the same territory. He's made P Club rep 22 out of the 23 years. What's your excuse? You know, I get it that he's got referrals and people, but he's built that. He's been in the same territory. He didn't hop around until he found the right territory that he felt. He worked his territory. If you work it and then you get out there, you know, don't don't ever take no as, as you know, the final. Don't stop. It's like, hey, you know, I'm going to keep coming to see you until you tell me yes. And when you do tell me yes, I'm still going to keep coming to see you. Because, you know, re- check up on them. They know that you care. They'll give you referrals, et cetera. Because I'm in a 100% hunter role. So typically once we turn that over, you know, we, we give it to service. However, that doesn't mean stop talking to the customers. Check in on them. Let them know you care. And then they'll refer you to other people. And that's how you build the business. And when you hear that victim mentality, does a light go off? Yes, absolutely. Because when I hear it, I'm just like, don't get out of sales as fast as you can. <laughs> I agree. A hundred percent. Marketing's hiring. Service is hiring. <laughs> right, right. That is the worst thing that you can be as a victim. You know, you've got to take all of the accountability and responsibility And even at times when it's not, you know, like you don't want to blame a customer ever. You know, my my theory too that I grew up to, and this is not widely spread now, is the customer is always right. The customer is still always right. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have those customers, you don't have your job. So you can spin it in a way where it's like, hey, you know what, Brian, tell me, tell me what I misunderstood. What did I miss? I, I think I just didn't hear everything you were saying, and I apologize. Can, could you repeat that one more time so I have a clear understanding? You don't have to say, hey, well, you didn't say that. You know, you, you just you just got to be finesse it enough, but take accountability. And you do that, so you'll have customers for life, yeah. you know, because everybody is always wanting to blame everybody else. Now, th- this other thing that I see all the time today is I either win or I learn. And then I'm like, well, what do you learn? Right. And is that is that what that lesson, the correct lesson? Right. Because if you lose a deal or a deal slips or they go with the competition, what's your lesson? Right. And that that's definitely a great thing to bring up. And the way that I address that with my reps is you've got to still dig and you've got to find out the why that they chose somebody else. Not just that they chose the other, you know, the competition. Why did they choose them? What made them take that deal over yours? What was it? Was it, you know, price on certain things? Was it, you know, the, you know, material on them, a better quality? I mean, if you don't know that, you can't go moving forward. So the next time you come around back to them, you'll know what to work on. But however, you can take that moving forward with other customers. So here, here's kind of a thought for you as well. This is kind of teaching them in the beginning to kind of get in the groove of if they do lose a deal to find out why. So when you go on the appointment and you get in, ask the question, why did you give me the appointment? You know, out of all the sales calls you get and all the people bombarding you all day long, every day, what was it that made you say, yes, I will see you and take a meeting with you? That's just as important because then you can kind of hone that in and use that more often to get into your other appointments and find out where there's a pattern at, but you won't know unless you ask. Yeah. And how about like forecasting? What are your favorite questions to get them focused on what you want them focused on? So again, I mean, I think you got to tie it back to their why and where they need to be. Because if those numbers aren't always in front of them of where they need to be, then they're not going to see it. They feel like they're doing 
their best. They feel like they're moving these accounts <laughs> forward because, you know, a lot of customers will string you along or tell you the things you want to hear. You know, come on. <laughs> I'm sure you heard it a time or two. Once and, or uh, <laughs> Right. So you've got to be really focused on that. And if you have a number in front of you, but yet you're you know, projections or your pipelines not adding up to these numbers, you know, you got to know your your percentage of sales. If Are you a 30% closer? Or are you a 40% closer? So if you have that, you've got to have a weekly number and check it off. If you miss your goal by a hundred bucks this week, guess what? Your goal increases a hundred bucks next week to keep you on that playing field. So if you show them that, and then you say, okay, how are you going to get there? And they show you the numbers. Well, I thought when we talked about this, you were, you know, had a goal of this. This is what you're needing. Well, you're short this amount of money. Where else are you going to be able to pull that and find it? And I think that's just key to always make sure that they know their numbers. And a mistake that I've done in the beginning is I would always know their numbers and where they should be and where they're not. And then I would be telling them every, in our PNRs, you know, our planning and review sessions, I would be just sharing all the information with them. And this is where you're at. And this is what you got. And, but then I learned too, that you've got to let them tell you, you got to let them run the meeting because first of all, it's their business. They should treat it as their own personal business. And they've got to be able to run it. They've got to know the numbers. And if I care more about their numbers and where they're at than they do, I'm wasting my time. And that word, care, it's that emotional attachment to winning or losing. Right. And what happens when you don't see that? Mm, You know you're in trouble. You know they're in trouble. Because I have to rely on them to make my extra money. You know, so obviously that's where my investment is to make sure that I can coach them and get them where they need to be to help make them successful so I can be successful. Because if my team's not successful, I'm not successful. And it's all on me. I got to take 100% responsibility for that because that that's my fault. But, yes, I, yeah. I've never seen a successful sales rep who wasn't competitive at some level. Absolutely. That's, that's huge. I mean, you got to have a competitive or competitive level and interest on, I think everything really, it makes it fun. I mean, it's just, well, you know, what's going to push you to do the extra work if right. you're comfortable losing. Right. Right. And one other thing that's a red flag too, is for me. So when I worked prior to coming to universe, I actually worked 12 years, a hundred percent commission and worked from home. Those are two things that are extremely hard to do. And not everybody can do those. Some people can do one or the other. Some can do both. Some can't do either. (laughs) They they just need to be at a job where they know exactly what to do at what time each day. And then, you know, that's it. But um, it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. I mean, you've got to be able to, to have that competitiveness. And when you're comfortable with making a salary because you get paid a week and you're not working more for the commission side of it. That's where there's a big problem in the industry. In in my opinion, I believe that there should be higher commissions where it's very obtainable and way less guaranteed pay. And, you know, when I, I had just the, the kind of opposite experience, I had a huge base and then I went out on my own, which I had no base. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And boy, and I always said, well, this base is so great. It's, you know, I get to focus on the more important things. But it, it locked me in a gilded cage. Right. Where, the, yeah, the attending the meetings were important because I got a big base. Right. <laughs> And when people called me to take a new job, it was like, well, you know, the base is 30, 40% less. Right. And I, I looked at that as a risk, but the upside was probably higher. Right. That That's very true. It's very true. I mean, I took a leap of faith when I went in and it was a hundred percent commission. I was on, you know, initially more my training period, they had me on a set amount. And I think I stayed on that longer than I should have, because, you know, I I didn't realize I was looking for stability. I was scared. I was afraid of taking that leap. And I stayed on it probably about six months too long. 
And when I went back and actually did the numbers, I, I wanted to kick myself because I, I missed out on quite a bit of money just in that six month period of time. So after that, 100% commission and just flew. And did it give you more discipline, more focus? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you go from hero to zero. Every morning you wake up is a new day. What you do now affects you two months from now. What you don't do now affects you two months from now. But by then you're climbing up a straight mud wall. There's yep. no way out. People hear the desperation in your voice. Nobody wants to talk to you now, you know, and, and it becomes so much harder. And then you get in that rut. And if you're lucky, you'll get a second chance and climb out. But most of the time by then it's too late. You get frustrated. It's just spiral after spiral. And then you end up leaving and going somewhere else because you need a fresh start. You need to be able to start over. And they think that that's always the case too, but that's a problem. Because right, they're going to have the same to, habits. Right. The scratch right. again, you have right. to build that up. Right. Now, what advice would you have for somebody, whether they should get into sales leadership or not? You have to be very flexible and open to doing a lot of several things. You can't just do it for yourself. Yeah. You, you can't have your own goals and just try to hit them through everybody else because that's not going to work. You have to be very open to it. You know, there, there's times where I think, oh, you know, I just want to do my own thing, meaning that I just want to focus on what I need to do, you know, answer to whoever I need to answer to. But then I know I have complete control of what I'm doing and how it's done. And I know it will get done in the way that I want to do it. And it's, you know, going to work. Um, but you can't do that in as sales manager. It's just the opposite. Right, exactly. And you have to have the patience to be able to do that because it, it's not easy. It, you can, you know, I'm surprised I still have my hair actually, you know, at times you just want to pull it out because you're just, oh, you want to try and get that across, but you have to adapt to each person and share your goals with them. And they need to know what, where you need to get and how they can help you. So if they're on board and you've got them, uh, you know, in agreement with that, I mean, it, it's it's a whole different world. But yeah, it's it's definitely night and day between um, when you've been in sales as an you know account executive all these years, and then you decide to go into management. You got a lot of wake up calls. <laughs> well, that's it because you think you can just. Uh, I now have five me's. Like right. You have right. you and five other people. <laughs> right, right. Totally different. And that, yeah, I've I've come leaps and bounds with uh, learning uh, management and what goes along with that. Cool. Hey, Melanie, really appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Uh, actually, I'm on LinkedIn. So Melanie Aspathia, that's A-Z-P-E-I-T-I-A. -E um, looking forward to meeting some new friends and people and uh, any way I can help you out, you know, reach out to me. I'll share some of my experiences or uh, whatever I can do to help you.